Welcome to Talks at Google Chicago. Today we're excited to announce Frank Schaefer joining us for his second talk here at Google. Uh, he just spoke in Cambridge last month, and you can find that talk on our Talks at Google YouTube channel. Introducing, in introducing Frank, it's hard to keep it brief, as it seems unlikely that one person could have amassed a resume that includes the following. Born into a family of prominent evangelicals, helping found the religious right in the United States, rejecting that political point of view and becoming a vocal opponent of the Tea Party, directing slasher movies, becoming a New York Times best-selling author of both fiction and nonfiction, becoming a visual artist whose work has been shown and collected around the world, a frequent guest on Rachel Maddow with appearances on Oprah, The Today Show, Fresh Air, and the BBC News. An in-demand lecturer who has spoken at Princeton, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. No longer a terrible father, and a pretty darn good grandfather. But most of all, a thoughtful, reflective observer of the human condition and our relation to spirituality, religion, art, and the universe. Oh yeah, one more thing. Um, we left out that he survived polio and that he also has recently become a member of the Greek Orthodox Church and many, many other things. There just isn't enough time. So please join me in welcoming Frank Schaefer. Thanks for coming out today. I gather I'm probably the last speaker in this room before you all move to your new, even swankier offices. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for having me uh, come talk with you. I, I really enjoyed the time down in Cambridge, at Google, and here as well. Uh, because as someone who grew up as a terminal dyslexic, Google is one of the things that has come to my aid as a writer. Um, in, in, in a weird way, your search engine is the only good spell check in the world. If I can even think of two letters in a word, I will eventually get there. Uh, whereas all, all the word stuff, without going into too much depth, let alone anything else, doesn't quite work the same. So I actually um, uh, really enjoy the possibility of coming here and talking with you because you, you have, uh, you folks, this company, uh, has actually made a huge difference to my life. And one of the ways it has changed uh, the way I look at things, and then I'll get into my talk in proper, is both um, these paintings of mine and also this book. I've had uh, success as an author. I have had some New York Times bestsellers, et cetera, et cetera. But I also am someone who has gotten heartily sick of the gatekeepers in this culture who, uh, for instance, when I wrote a book called Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, um, which is what I'll be talking about a little today, and, and you all are, have got some copies there at the back you can take with you that I'll sign for you if you want them. Um, going through the routine channels, the marketing folks from some of the publishing companies that have been very successful with my books in the past said, well, we, our marketing people don't even know what shelf to put this on. You've got to decide who you are and what you are, you know, is this going to go on the Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins shelf? Or is this some sort of spirituality book that will, will mark it like we would a Deepak Chopra book? Where is it coming from? And of course, the whole point of the title, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, is a kind of a countercultural rebellion against the labels that our celebrity culture, our fast-moving culture, likes to give people as a shorthand so we don't have to think. And so uh, when, when I ran into that, the wonderful uh, fact was that being able now to have an art gallery online for my paintings, these are two out of my spring series uh, that go together, and I brought them because they're small enough to go into my carry-on on an airplane. Come up and take a look if you want afterward. Um, or whether it was writing a book that did not fit with the marketing strategy of people who were set in cement since the 19th century, in terms of the way books are published and marketed, the, the work that you all are in at Google has actually opened the doors up, and it's very counterintuitive because I'm a hands-on person. I only know what I know about my iPhone and my laptop, but I'm not a computer type of person. Paintings are labor-intensive. Uh, I get honorable dirt under my fingernails. This isn't done at a distance or on a, on a device of some sort. Writing is not a high-tech enterprise. I used to write on longhand on yellow uh, 
uh, pads and uh, my wife would type this thing up and I finally learned how to type about 20, 30 years ago and then uh, jumped into computers and all the rest of it. But the beauty of the period of history we are in, and there is a real interface here between Google and the past, is that we are now at a time when people are growing up in a mediated reality. Children, for instance, you see on airplanes who don't have toys or books or anything else, aren't looking out the window at the country passing under them, but instead are looking at some tech device interpreting the country for them, more likely to be looking at it on a screen than in reality. But then you get to people like me, who still earn their living doing this, real stuff that you can feel and touch, that exists only in one place in time, of which there's a one-off thing, or the trend you see of people going back to vinyl, collecting records, or playing musical instruments hands-on, busking in the street, whatever. And what has happened, and, and, and what my book, this counterintuitive title, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, How to Give Love, Create Beauty and Find Peace, is about, is this kind of collision of the old and the new, where the best of the old is actually facilitated by the new, because it gives someone like me a direct access to, for instance, people I've shipped art to collectors in Ireland and Switzerland and all over the U.S. and other places in the world that in terms of a geographical location I can never touch. But they can Google me, they can go online, they can find me, and after they get through all the bullshit by right-wing activists about what a horrible person I am because I came out of the religious right and became a traitor, they eventually get to some item about the fact he's a painter, he's been shown in this and that gallery, or they get to the fact he's an author, and they may even stumble across something I have actually written instead of just the invective written about me or uh, you know whatever they might find. So I'm someone standing here as a writer and an artist who lives in a very different world than those of you who were working for Google in this room, and yet you are facilitating what in actuality would be perfectly understandable to an artist in 15th or 16th century Florence, like Fra Angelico or someone like that, that world is now more alive than it was in the pre-computer age when the gatekeepers were able to shut down any individual who didn't quite fit. Painting was supposed to have disappeared by now because art critics in the 50s and 60s said that post-American abstract expressionism there would be no more painters. There are now more people painting, more people drawing, more people going back to high-tech draftsmanship than ever. And the way they can do that is because the world is no longer created and controlled for art and the humanities by the New York Times, Harvard, a few art schools, half a dozen theater critics, but actually is accessible now to everyone. The downside, of course, is you get a lot of crap out there. The upside is, however, when you wade through that and can make decisions for yourself, you now have a world of creativity at your fingertips uh, where someone like me, uh, who is an artist and a writer, can access that world while knowing nothing about the technology uh, that facilitates it, but yet can be there. Um, one of the great geniuses of Google is, is making things simple enough and taking the complexity out without being condescending to people like me of another generation who can come into the Google world and use it and have other people use this to find what we do. So I want to give you a little flavor of this book, talk a little more, and then open it up for some discussion because I think we could have some interesting Q&A uh, after this. Let me give you a flavor of the book in two parts. First of all, because I'm a novelist, I've written novels like Portofino, Saving Grandma, Zermatt, uh, and God Said Billy, and so forth, works of fiction. I'm a storyteller. I tend not to put footnotes in my nonfiction books, although I footnoted a long memoir of mine called Crazy for God because people wanted names and dates uh, so they would see I wasn't completely lying about my unlikely background of uh, in one lifetime flying around in Jerry Falwell's borrowed jet and being the keynote speaker at the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm not kidding you. Uh, 23,000 pastors, this is in the late 70s, you've never seen much, so much blue polyester in your life. Um, if you can remember the fashions in those, that period of history. Uh, and then fast forward to the present. So there's two kind of aspects to this book. There's the storytelling and then there's the kind of didactic exposition. And I'll just give you one paragraph from the beginning here that sort of sets up a little bit of what the book is overall about and then give you a touch of the storytelling and then talk a little more and then take questions. 
early on in the book I write, maybe we need a new category other than theism, atheism, or agnosticism that takes paradox and unknowing into account. I believe that life evolved by natural selection. I believe that evolutionary psychology explains away altruism and debunks love and that brain chemistry undermines my illusion of free will and personhood. I also believe that the spiritual reality hovering over, in, and through me calls me to love, trust, and hear the voice of my creator. It seems to me that there is an offstage and an offstage, onstage quality to my existence. I live on stage, but I sense another crew working offstage. Sometimes I hear their voices singing in a way that's as eerily beautiful as an offstage chorus in an opera. And so what I'm trying to encapsulate there at the beginning of the book is to let people know that real life experience, not intellectual ideas about life, but the actual experience that you and I have of life, of love, of tragedy, of discovering our sexuality, of parenthood, of whatever it may be, is always filled with paradox rather than certainty. The only way to get rid of that paradoxical aspect of your life is to become a certainty addict and to flatten out the questions with an overall theory of everything, if you could put it that way, that leaves you free to no longer ask questions that are inconvenient to your worldview. But having traveled from fundamentalist Christianity to uh, an open and paradoxical embrace of unknowing, or what was in history theologically called apophatic theology, which was the theology of unknowing about God, not what you could say about God, what you couldn't say. This actually fits the way that I have experienced reality itself. And I'll give you an example of that. I got my wife Jeannie pregnant when we were 17 and 18. And had three children as a child. Now I'm a grandfather of five grandchildren, and because I got Jeannie pregnant when we were 17 and 18, and my daughter went off to NYU and got married at 22 and had a baby and now moved to Finland and is a high-tech energy consultant for the European Union. See, so I'm not completely uh, just living off in the woods somewhere getting people pregnant. She went off and got an education and all the rest of it. Um, but in comparing the difference between me then, this young jerk, who was mean to his daughter because he was an impatient young fool, no knowledge of parenthood, and by God's grace wound up as a good friend with his daughter, but only by grace, to the person now who cares for Jack, Lucy, and Nora, my three youngest grandchildren who live across the street from me, ages seven, five, and 17 months, as a hands-on, uh, stay-at-home grandfather most days with those kids while my son and daughter-in-law go to work, and Jeannie and I do childcare, and I get up very early in the morning to write. I always did. It's no sacrifice, so my work goes on, uh, and I paint after they, uh, they leave. But those two people, in just this, you know, I'm 63 now, and I was 17, 18, 19 then, that you can have two totally different people inhabiting one body and experiencing life completely differently in the trajectory of just one human life when I think back to the certainties that that teenager had about how to raise kids and what to do and discipline them, and by, at that point in my life I was into Calvinist theology I was raised in, that I was the head of the home, and my wife should do what I tell her, my child should do what I tell them, they should be punished and disciplined, spare the rod, spoil a child, all this nonsense. And where I am today with my grandchildren, and the pleasure and delight that I find in them, the idea that somehow these truths are fixed and related to fixed points rather than paradoxical learning curves where you find yourself at one point of your life utterly denying and arguing with yourself at another point of your life, if you can understand what I'm saying, that this can happen in one individual short lifetime, which is like the lifespan of a fruit fly after all. I mean, we're just gone. We're here instantly and gone. If I've learned one thing, it's that the only accurate description of life's passage is paradox, and the only certainty is uncertainty. And this doesn't mean everything is relativistic in the sense that there's no fixed points in my life that I cling to, like these grandchildren, but it simply introduces a note of humility 
into the process of trying to decide who and what you are. And so uh, I want to read you this other little passage that comes from the book to give you the flavor of this kind of storytelling element um, and where my head is really at, having set it up a little bit more in the argumentative form earlier. I take these kids, or last year I did, Lucy's in second grade now and Jack is in kindergarten, but they were both in the same preschool a couple years ago, and this comes out of that experience, and I think cuts to the nub of where I'm coming from, but also this kind of human story of learning. At first, the mothers, this is in the preschool, couldn't figure me out. What was this old guy hang doing hanging around? Why was he unshaved with uncombed hair and torn jeans and paint all over his clothes? Shouldn't someone call the police? Because I was picking them up at, at uh, preschool. After seeing me every day for a year, the moms know me. Some know I'm a writer and artist, so the paint spattered look is accepted. One mom checked me out online and discovered I've been interviewed by Oprah and Terry Gross on NPR's Fresh Air. Even a minor celebrity is accorded some eccentric artist slack, at least in the arts-friendly Boston area. I could show up in my bathrobe and slippers these days and no one would mind. I'm just one of the gang, albeit somewhat of a character. The mothers and I discuss one child's cold and how fast the rest of us are likely to catch it. We commiserate about the latest pink eye blight. We talk about one child who wakes up in the night and celebrate the quantum leap another little girl made with her drawing skills after discovering chalk pastel. We know who is pregnant with her second or third child and share strategies for helping a little boy who is scared of pooping because he's sure something is down there. We congratulate one mom for finally getting a job with health care insurance benefits and commiserate with another about the challenging child care schedule of a night nurse. Some of the mothers are stay-at-home parents while others hurry away from the office at lunchtime to meet their child, deliver her to the babysitter, and race back to work. Some have told me about problems with teenage stepchildren, previous marriages, divorces, and their struggles to fit into New England after moving from a friendlier part of the country. Some moms arrive in old cars while other drive new SUVs. No matter what we drive or earn, or if we're married, black, brown, white, single, gay, heterosexual, or divorced, when we get down on our knees at eye level with our babies as they run into our arms, we understand each other perfectly. The child we're meeting touches the core of our being. Every mom delights in the pint-sized human shouting, Hi, Mommy! The shouted greeting that makes my heart skip is, Hi, Ba! Our shared experience of vulnerability erases the age and gender differences between the young mothers and me. We share a fearful solidarity. Call it the flip side of love. If anything awful were to happen to the child clamoring into our arms, the universe, as we know it, would end. And that's the truth of human existence as I understand it. It's not some big summary of theology or philosophy or marketing strategy. That's it. And everything else is a distraction. And what's so interesting to me is when I was having lunch today with Josh, I was trying to think about, he's talking about his, cho his child, and I'm talking about my grandchildren. And the way I would put it is this. At age 63, with five grandchildren, Having had a lot of striving years, you know, I was in Hollywood, I made four feature films, they were all crap, but nevertheless, I sat in a director's chair. Uh, I've had a couple of bestsellers, I've done this and that. That said, I can honestly say that the core of the human relationships that that story gets to is the only part of my life today that I have no second thoughts about. There's no period of my life or no activity, no achievement or no failure that I look back on without another point of view. Like, maybe this was just a waste of time. There was a year when my kids were little before I moved to the States from Switzerland when I spent six months on the road away from my children doing stupid things like being at the Southern Baptist Convention, sharing the platform with Ronald Reagan at the Christian Broadcasters Association, hanging around with people like Jack Kemp, who was then running, or soon to run, for vice presidential candidate with Bob Dole, blah, blah, blah. And at the time, it was all very exciting and high pressure. It was a big deal. Um, all the rest of it. I look back on that now as 99% wasted time. The only glimmer of hope I have in that is I learned from that what true, unmitigated, unvarnished bullshit looks like and can now avoid it better in, in the last years of my life. But that's it. 
But when I am with Laura, who's 17 months old, and she comes in every morning and puts her arms around my neck and lays her head on my shoulder, and I take care of her for three or four blessed hours while Jeannie finishes her day's work, there is not a second of that time that I would trade, literally, and this is not hyperbole, for anything anyone in this room or anywhere in the world could offer me at any given moment, seriously. I wouldn't walk away from 10 seconds with Nora to guarantee my next book is a bestseller, if that was the trade. And if I need to write, I just get up a little earlier. And this is not altruism. This is the most selfish statement I can make to you, but it's made from a point of view of actual life experience. So when I come into places like Google, or I talk at writers' conferences or universities, to a lot of high-powered people, you've never met more nervous and unhappy people than PhD candidates, by the way. <laughs> My feeling often is to try to say, hey, look, let me give you something that maybe you're not expecting in this talk on the collision of religion and politics, which is why, for instance, Rachel Maddow will have me on, and so forth and so on. Let me, as Oprah would say, share my heart with you. Do not do as much as I did in more formative years that I now look back on as unmitigated wasted time. And I'm not talking about the religious right. I mean, don't do so much now that you will regret when you get past the hunger for your striving years and realize that 99% of it was bullshit. You have to have the human dimension to your life or you will regret it. I promise you that. Now, I know a few minutes ago I said I'm not certain about anything, and I know I sound pretty certain about that. But that's my experience. And the paradox of that experience is this. The things that I wanted most in some parts of my life actually turned out to be the most hollow and meaningless. The things that I kind of thought would always be around, like these children of mine I had that I didn't pay enough attention to because I was so busy doing my hotshot bullshit, the, the times with my wife building a relationship where I was fool enough to not realize that the, the, the way that you establish a relationship with someone is not going to some seminar or reading a book or a philosophy of dating or trying to meet the perfect person. It's bringing your lover, or your wife, whomever you're with, a cup of coffee in bed in the morning. It's, it's uh, cleaning up a little bit when she's too tired to do that. It's, it's forget the roses and all the rest of it after a fight. Have the humility to just say you were wrong. It's the human stuff that we take for granted that actually takes a lifetime to get to, where you can look back and see a path that got you to that place. And the only thing I don't regret about my checkered and stupid past, that if you read the book you'll get a little bit of a hint of, is that it got me to where I'm standing right now this afternoon with uh, five grandchildren waiting for me who love me, a daughter who will Skype me tomorrow morning again from, from Brussels where she works at the European Union, and who will tell me where she is and does what I do when I'm talking here to you guys she puts her laptop where she's talking, and during her talk sometimes just puts it on Skype and turns it around so her, her dad can see where she is and then turns it back. And we only have a 10-second communication. That's the moment of my day that lights up. Because, because uh, here's a child who uh, had this tough childhood with this strict, stupid father who was a kid raising a, uh, a, 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 a daughter who's turned into this golden grown-up. and. Uh, who loves me enough to share a little piece of her life with me just about every day to show me what she's up to. And when I look at that structure of a day, you know, pitching my new book to my agent, he's going to be sending it out, all this, all that stuff matters. But it only matters the way footnotes in books matter. It isn't the real story. And so this book really is a couple of things. It, uh, it came out of um, a, a memoir I wrote called Crazy for God. And the reason I wrote this book is that um, it started when Christopher Hitchens, the author, before he died, read Crazy for God and really liked it, emailed me a number of times and started calling me as he read his way through it, telling me that he thought it was a good book and that I'm a good writer and so forth and so on. They're all very nice. And then he got to the end of the book and we had a last conversation. He says, I'm really disappointed because I thought you were now going to finish the book by saying you become one of us, one of us being on the cusp of the new atheist movement that was emerging then. And he said, you know, I finished the book. I don't even know what you believe. You sort of sound like a person of faith still. What, what, you know, why don't you just take this step? At the same time, some of my old evangelical friends from my past, because my father, Francis Schaeffer, was this well-known evangelical. I don't mean well-known on the street. I mean well-known in his ghetto. Uh, we, we all have our little ghettos we live in. 
Uh, I get emails from them saying, we, we love the story, it's time somebody told the truth about the rise of the religious right and how it all came about, but we're very disappointed. We thought you'd get to the end of the book and declare a straightforward kind of declaration that in spite of all this, you're still a man of faith. Literally, if you change the line or two from my evangelical fundamentalist friends and from my atheist fundamentalist friends, it was the same email, and what was bothering both of them was ambivalence and paradox of being able to say, look, the actual way life is, is not a series of watertight conclusions which now obviate you from, from thinking anymore. One question just leads to the next, and it's the overall experience, and where it matters is not that you get your head right with God if you're an evangelical, or get your philosophy right and, and march side by side with Chris Hitchens or, or Dawkins. What matters is your relationship with the people in your life, who you love most, about whom you will regret nothing, except that you treated them badly sometimes, but will look back and understand that the actual purpose of all this other stuff was that. And so the intellectual discussion about life, and about its meaning, and about philosophy and theology, masquerades as the point itself, as if, you know, the old evangelical theology was if you can get your heart right with God and believe the correct theology, you'll be saved and otherwise you're lost. In my experience, and what I argue for in why I'm an atheist who believes in God and why the book finishes up with this subtitle, How to Give Love, Create Beauty and Find Peace, is to sidestep what everyone tells you are the big questions. Your career. Who you should marry when to have children, how your biological clock is doing, if you believe in God or not, and realize that the real game and the only game and the only thing you will not regret is the time you spend not looking for perfection of belief or the perfect mate or when you should have a child, but to work with what you have on the human scale and make that work. That's it. That is the only game in town. And in a way, I sometimes look at the super wealthy in our country, and of course I'm not thinking of Donald Trump right now, and I say to myself, a great amount of wealth is actually, I think, a form finally of mental illness. Because the time it takes to generate that type of wealth, unless you're just very lucky as an artist and you just get famous because someone loves your first album, or you invent something incredible and, uh, and, and it becomes a phenomenon, but for the kind of people who set out looking for wealth as an end in itself, the energy that that demands means that they have made a trade. They have trampled on the relationships that in the end were the whole point anyway. Many, many times. I'm not saying for everyone. So in a sense, someone who's chased that kind of wealth, the kind of person who really, really, really wants to head to Wall Street and make just a shitload of money, and that's where their head's at, this is a form of sickness. And so our whole definition of success in this world is very odd, because we, deform, we, we, we define the mental illness that we call success, according to the American dream, as an end in itself that's worth sacrificing everything to, the human relationships. And so at, I guess at the grand old age of 63, and looking at these grandchildren of mine, my question is no longer, how much money did you make? Did you ever get that PhD and become a vice president of your corporation? It's, What's your relationship with your lover and your child? How much time do you have in your life for your grandchildren? And by the way, does the word mortality ring a bell? Did you think this was going on forever? And that in turn becomes very close to the sort of questions that the prophets in every religious tradition ask. Whether it's a religious tradition that is uh, fastened into something like Christianity or a sort of a pseudo-religious tradition of philosophy. But those questions of character those questions of personal growth, those questions of having room in your life for the purpose of life itself, which is not all this stuff around you, but is the actual experience of love, the actual experience of relationships, the actual experience of, of unconditional trust. These are the things that get all this other glass and steel we have around us looking out of this building, without which this is just crap. And, and essentially what I'm going for here in the book is saying, that if you begin from the idea of paradox, and you begin from the idea of human relationships, and you begin from the idea of rejecting these certainties that you hang everything on, get your PhD, make this much money per year, 
wait until you're this certain age to have a child. Try to meet the perfect mate. Get rid of the person you fell in love with in high school because it wasn't the right time. And now you're 40 and looking around. Okay, now you've got all your ducks in a row. You, you step out, you're going to try to get this perfect relationship going. That is applying the business model, which is broken. It's a mental illness to the core of life itself, which can't be treated that way, because last time I checked, we're biological machines that look at the world through spiritual eyes. So we're always at war with ourselves, because we have this physical reality, yet we don't see it that way. I'm a biological machine, so why would I do something like this? It has nothing to do with survival. I can make my living without selling paintings. Why do I do this? Well, these are the questions that are unanswerable because our evolutionary cycle of history from being single-celled creatures till the present, coming out of a material universe, doesn't really have room for the need for art and aesthetics and why somebody would sit around doing stuff like this or, or take all this time and waste it by taking care of their grandchildren or look back on the successes and see them as failures in, 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 in as much they, they were taken away from the things that in the end really matter. So I'd like to leave you with those thoughts and just go back to the theme that I had at the beginning, and then we'll have a little Q&A session. I wanted to read you something, and obviously I didn't know I'd be talking at Google, so I'm not sucking up to you, but this is actually what I wrote. Um, a new generation is embracing human connection rather than debunking it. The liberating results are real. The geeks, bless them, are killing off the jaded, cold-hearted gatekeepers. When I was a young artist in the 1970s, I had to travel to a gallery, slides in sweaty hand, and beg for a meeting with the owner if I wanted to sell a painting. If the owner loved my work, I'd be invited back a year or two later, and he or she would put a few paintings in a show. I wandered off into the movie business and quit painting, and found the same was true of there, with script meetings and all the rest. When I resumed painting in 2006, I worked for eight years until I liked my work enough to show it. I started a website in 2014 and now sell art directly to collectors worldwide. There are no gatekeepers in sight, it's just me directly in touch with people who like my work. In other words, the baggage is stripped away by the technology and we get back to the basic human relationship facilitated by something that is inhuman, just like I'm a biological machine, but I look at the world with spiritual eyes. So here's this weird thing. Uh, Google ought to start its own religion, it worked for Scientology. <laughs> the same goes for my writing. I self-published this book, given the best-selling status of some of my previous books, several of my former secular publishers and several religious publishers were interested in publishing it. However, they wanted me to craft this book to fit their marketing strategies. Does it go on the new atheist or the religion shelf, they asked. Can you rewrite it to fit one or the other market? My answer was no, yet you are reading the book I wrote. I don't view you as a market segment. I view you as my partner, an individual reader, a friend, as complex and maybe even as conflicted as I am. Why should either of us fit in anywhere? My liberators in Silicon Valley have freed me to write for you directly and say what I want to anyone when I want to say it. The internet and its innovators are doing more to facilitate the reemergence of content-laden, craft-rich, hands-on, individuality and perhaps even spirituality in all the galleries, agents, critics, churches, and publishers combined. And that brings this talk to the conclusion and we'll have a couple questions and so I would just simply say, think of the paradox. The most spiritually facilitating organizations in the world are high-tech firms which deal in ones and zeros electronically about as far away from the human experience you can get and yet I can sit in my studio and paint because of that. I can go directly to a reader. I can be in my office at any time I want working online. I don't have to be in the Harvard Library. What took me three weeks before Google I can do in three minutes, literally. And guess where I can take that time and use it? I can play with Nora. I can be in my front yard as she picks up windfalls and eats them off the ground, and I say, never mind, worms never hurt anybody. She's enjoying it. I won't tell her. We're just primates after all. She likes this. So that paradoxical kind of view of technology is what I hope people who work for Google and other high-tech companies understand. And that is, in the end, what you're doing is not about science or money. What you're doing is, for me, 
is letting me play with a granddaughter because I don't have to sit in the library all day. But, and here's the caveat, the kind of ambitions out of which things like Google spring also can grind people up in the same way the movie business can or the publishing business or anything else. And I would urge you, I would urge you to, especially if you're not as old as I am, to not trade in what in the end will be the things for your own life that actually work for you forever. Combining this biological animal with this creature who looks at the world through spiritual eyes. Don't trade in that possibility for yourself while you're giving someone like me that opportunity. That would be a shame. Find the Nora in your own life. Find the genie to bring a cup of coffee to in bed in your own life. Find the thing that you care about more than working strategically within a corporate environment so that you wind up as a person and not simply vote with your feet and your time, as it were, for the biological machine, but rather understand you're also looking at the world through spiritual eyes. And the reason I wrote Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God is to just open that discussion up. So with that, thank you, and I'll repeat the questions you ask so that uh, Josh can get them on the tape he's making, and you can ask about anything you want. It doesn't have to be stick with the talk here, uh, you know, whatever, whatever comes to mind. And we'll take the rest of the time on a couple questions, and just feel free, shout them out. Or disagree, or, you know, whatever. If you th There is an escape route here, if you didn't like what I was saying. I can make the door before you can get to me, polio or not. So, let's go for it. Yes? Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, this is kind of amusing to me because it's a very similar, I feel like it's a very similar path. I was working in Washington, with a lot of groups that you probably criticize on Rachel Maddow, um, got really caught up in the rat race of that, decided, you know, let's just move across the country. Uh, focus on family or, right. uh, you know, more of the personal life you were talking about. Uh, with the ambivalence, with the loss of either a political or religious mission, and just kind of saying it's okay not to know the answer, Sure. do you ever struggle for, you know, what is the good you want to do in life? Or, or how do you bring good into this world without a very certain direction? Sure. I think it's a great question. How do you bring good into this world without a certain direction? If you're all into ambivalence and paradox, you know, do you ever donate blood or is that paradoxical too, so to speak, right? Sure. Yeah, and I, I would start in bite-sized pieces again without drawing the huge conclusion. The first thing I do is that with my three granddaughters, they will have known someone who was a male figure who loved them unconditionally and who gave them the security of knowing that they are smart and beautiful and talented and articulate and I am in their corner. So I will send three young women into the world who will make their own choices and make their own mistakes, but they will not look back and say there was no one there for me. That I will guarantee. That's the beginning of changing the world. It will be fully operational, equipped young women who at least knew one man who really had their good at heart, and that doesn't include my, their father, who's also great, and so forth and so on. So I'm just starting with that in terms of what can I do. My two grandsons, I hope we'll go into the world understanding that they had a grandfather who was humble enough to apologize when he yells at them and mean it, who sends them out knowing that manhood is not abusing people and lording it over them, who are not going to join some fraternity and think it's a good, fun thing to get a young woman drunk and abuse her because they were exposed to somebody who treated them and treated the women in his life around him, at least at this age, with some dignity and respect. And instead of having a bunch of crap stuff in the house talking down to them, there are open art books in just about every room. And I don't think it's normal to have a child growing up knowing who all the superheroes are who's never heard of Mozart. I don't think it's normal to start with Disney-fied Pablo when you have a world of child literature out there. So they will have had that. So I am investing my time in trying to be subversive of what I think are the false values of an entertainment culture concentrate on the personal, concentrate on the art that lasts, go for the good stuff, try to get it into their heads before all the marketers arrive with the crap. That's job one. That's just the grandchildren. So extend that out to the grown children. And you are there for them. And you are apologizing for the mistakes you made. And you are talking to your wife and they see you fight with her and you are backing down and saying, I'm sorry, I've been an asshole today, and you don't mind if they hear it. So they are growing up in an environment where this old idiot has at least learned something to pass on to them by the doing of it. That, to me, is interacting with the world. 
And then when it comes to political things, I was one of the first bloggers for Huffington Post. I've done a lot of political blogging. I, I have two kinds of writing. The nice guy is here and the cage fighter is in some of my blogs. For instance, the one that I wrote called The Slow Motion Lynching of President Barack Obama that had a huge, like millions, literally millions of, of reads around the world and was about the fact that I'm ashamed to be a white American in a political environment that takes our first African American president, who also had more on his desk on day one than anybody we've ever put in the White House, treated him like shit, lied about him consistently, and formed an entire governmental opposition to this man based on rather bring the country down, risk the economy, stall the government, default on our international debts, rather than let him have any modicum of success. And so I say what I think about that from a platform of a writer who has a little bit of a platform. Not much, I'm not famous, I just earn my living, that's it. But I do turn around and hit hard when it comes not to defending my views, but to political views. Now, right or wrong, I don't think those things can't go together, speaking of paradox. I think you can be this grandfather who's concentrating on what's in front of you, and at the same time you can speak out and use your platform. So those would be some of the things that in my own life I try to work together. Yeah, another question. Come on, you all have something you want to say. You can't have agreed with everything I said. Or liked it. Throw something. Yes, please. So, um, I think a lot of these ideas are, are really cool and, and they sound good, especially for people who uh, work in an office all day, um, but I'm just wondering, what do you think about the other side in terms of, you know, the only people who go on a different path in, in our college dropouts that you hear from are the ones who are really successful, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or someone like that, um, but what, what the, and me. yeah, well, the people who um, kind of go off um, live an alternative lifestyle and, and find, you know, that they're not able to succeed or, or, or just have regrets or, or, or disillusionment. I'm just wondering if, if you've experienced that, um, if you have any perspective on sure. that. I think that's a great question. I mean, you know, you only hear success stories, alternative stuff. Remember, you know, we came out, of, I came out of the 60s, so I, I know all about how countercultural alternatives turn out, um, and they usually don't. But I'm not talking so much about dropping out of a system. I'm talking about carving a life out within that where you get your priorities straight. You know, it's up here. It isn't out there. So the fact of the matter is, the first business at hand is to decide what we really care about as an individual, whatever the environment is, whether it's in an office, whether it's in a corporation, you're a freelance, you're a writer, self-unemployed as I call myself, whatever it may be. Um, that factor doesn't change how we relate to another human being. And this is why I'm still so interested in spirituality, and most particularly the example of Christ. Uh, and my, my uh, atheist friends will hate that I just said Christ instead of Jesus, because that intimates you think he's the son of God and so forth. So, hey, you know, looking into the camera here, stop being so theological. Uh, I was raised the way I was raised. So um, I'll call him Christ if I didn't well want to. Um, but the fact of the matter is, when you look at the teaching of Jesus, it was never the law. It was, he always said, well, here's what the law says, and then he had this big word he uses, but here's what I say to you. So the law says, throw these stones at this woman caught in adultery, but here's what I'm telling you. The law says, when he talks to the Samaritan woman, I have some of this in the book, um, we shouldn't even be talking together because I'm a Jew and you're a Samaritan. This is like Jesus meeting a leader from ISIS. Okay, really, they hated each other. We shouldn't even be on the same mountain. She's saying we shouldn't be talking. He says, none of this matters. A day is coming when it's not going to be an issue of the law, but, but truth and spirit, exactly what I'm talking about here. So I think that our battle is not where we work. Our battle is not our career. Our battle is not whether you're working in an office or drop out and live this fanciful, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, whatever it is, life. I think our battle, genuinely, is a spiritual battle. And it's the battle to see other human beings as we see ourselves first. And not to see everybody around us as useful tools to climb something that in the end turns out to be totally self-defeating, because while climbing it, we have ignored the real thing that would have given our life purpose and meaning. So, I don't think this battle is won or lost by people who are conventional or unconventional or corporate or artistic. 
The most creative people in the world right now are working often in corporations like Google, like Microsoft, like Facebook. It isn't a question of the artist types and the spiritual types versus the creative types uh, versus the business types. There's an amalgam there, and that's another paradoxical truth. So I would just say spirituality really matters. This is one way, place I totally get off the boat with the new atheist movement that boils it all down to science and facts in the same way that fundamentalists of the Christian right boil it all down to create theology, taking America back, blah, 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 blah. I think we have to come up with a different vocabulary that bypasses these surface differences, who works in an office, who's gay, who's straight, who's black, who's white, who's a grandfather, who's never had any kids, and understand there's a much deeper truth we're all going for. And that is our relationship with the human beings around us and, the, and through them the world around all of us. And that's something that's a matter of how we see things. Now, weirdly enough, that also leads to a kind of creative life. And I think the two things go together. So that may not be full enough answer, but it's, it's the best I can do. Yeah, another question. It seems to me that you're really uh, making a comment here about you know the human element and that the gray hair and that we shouldn't really live in these different extremes. But when we look at like our government, you know we have you know the the guns, you know re religious, you know Republican views, right. all this stuff, and then we have the far you know the far left. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, and how do we break the cycle and get out of kind of this packaging that everything has to to sit in today? Well, I think one way the cycle gets broken, and I, I promise you I'm not doing this because of where, you know, because of this, the Google thing here, but the, the, the availability of information and choice is huge. So one of the big generational shifts, it's not an accident, for instance, that the attitudes towards gay men and women and transgender and transsexual people has changed. Sure, there's some cultural <clears throat> impetus. Sure, there was some entertainment and some TV programs that humanize people, et cetera, et cetera. But the real thing is the same phenomena that you find in a family where someone is gay, where they know someone who's gay, and it's like, well, wait a minute, it isn't them anymore. It's my friend, uh, you know, Joe over here, or my daughter, or uh, whoever. Um, the humanizing of the other is the battle today. The humanizing of the other is our battle today. Now the question is, how do we do this? Well, Google is doing it, simply by putting the information out there. It's not achieving the, the final result. That's up to individual human beings. But it's hard to demonize people you know a click away when you can have their life and their picture, their story, their, their little whatever they're putting on YouTube. It's tough to demonize them because now we know them intimately in a way two generations ago no one could know anyone who they didn't spend a lifetime researching. So the intimacy of the information highway is one of the great things we can look for to help us. This has to continue. And what we mustn't allow to happen, and this is just my own humble opinion, I'm certainly not an expert, is commercializing the information highway to the point where it looks like you're being conned when you go on it. This will poison us. This will poison us because we need to keep it semi idealistic. We have to have accessibility. So I think that's one huge point. And then the second point I think that's happening is that I'm not pessimistic. I think there's a generational shift taking place here. The anger you see gathered around Donald Trump, these insane people who, you know, Mexicans are rapists and we've got to build walls, all this horrible, and may I just say it, un American, filth, fascist crap. It's not American. This is not in our tradition. Well, sure it is. It's Jefferson being a slave owner. It's very American. But it's not the America we all want to think we're part of. Uh, this circle the wagons attitude. The, the only way to combat that is for the succeeding generation, the younger people, to simply hold in there long enough for these idiots to begin to go away. And when you look at, for instance, who Fox News' basic viewer is, he's a guy my age. Uh, and he is, like me, not going to be around as long as some of the younger people in this room, although I intend on being. Um, so I think there's a generational shift coming. I wouldn't get too terribly pessimistic right now. 
I think there really is. And I think that you see, the fury you see in ISIS and the fury you see in the Taliban and this horror of destroying the great cultural monuments of North Africa in the name of Islam, all this stuff, or why people would, would coalesce around a Donald Trump and his hate-filled language and the whole Republican effort to try to shut down President Obama over these last years. Actually, there's an encouraging part to that. Because in my experience of human life anyway, you don't get that level of passion from people who feel secure and that they're on the winning side. They know they're losing. The demographics are shifting. This country will be brown. And we are becoming younger in terms of our attitudes. And gay people will get married. And it doesn't matter whether somebody says she won't give a marriage license or a Donald Trump comes along. It's sound and fury signifying nothing. It's damn hard to live through if you're looking toward a future. But actually, and I know this sounds, uh, you know, you don't hear this too often, but I am very optimistic about the future of North America in so many ways. As I go around talking in schools and universities, I don't meet hate-filled people. I talk to people who are open to others most of the time, who want to live lives that incorporate others. Attitudes are changing, and I think the information highway has a lot to do with that. And I think, as I said in the book, one of the things I say in Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God is one of the paradoxes in my own life is that the most spiritually alive place right now is, you could say, the least uh, traditional and the least spiritual in that it's also, again, the internet highway. I, you know, there, um, the discussion I have on my Facebook page, I happen to answer all the messages I get. I happen to answer all my emails. I, I try to take that human element into a discussion with my readers. It's one reason I enjoy being a writer. It, it's being facilitated paradoxically by something that doesn't seem to have anything to do with spirituality. And yet it really does.